if Erica had her way, we would live right next to that uh, Air Force or the Air, uh, you know, pilot to take off mm-hmm. thing. And that will uh, take wow. Very cool. That's a that's a pretty penny Coronado. So my grandparents okay. bought their house in like nineteen I don't know fifty or something like that, and they bought it for like thirty thousand dollars. And it's, it was just a, a you know a two, two two story five bedroom house, and you know, but nothing special. Um, and then w- w- after after both of them passed away, there were um, there were f- um, five kids, and they um, sorry the phone's ringing. Um, th- th- there were um, f- five kids, and the house sold for two point seven million dollars, oh. and they got split. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it's, so about six months later, so the, the people that bought it, they bought it um, to, to be their summer um, vacation home, and that's what it was the very first summer. And then they tore it down. They kept one wall for um, city um, um, for the c- c- city permits. Jeez, I have like turned off. Wow! Sorry. And then um, rebuilt the new house, I guess. Yeah, it, it looks completely different. It looks like it should be um, in um, you know, New Hampshire or Connecticut or something like that now. Mm-hmm. It's gorgeous, but it's yeah, not my grandparents' home. It's not the home that we, we went to all the time. Damn. Wow. That's crazy. That's crazy. Our next-door neighbor tells some story about how he bought a house out in a really well-to-do area in Portland for like 17000 about 30 years ago, and it's last time he checked, it was like 900000 So to see it go from thirty to 2.7, <laughs> that's, yeah. that's pretty amazing. Yeah, they, they didn't think that they were going get, to get that amount. That they thought, you know, somewhere in the ones, um, and they, they were quite shocked. Good yeah. for them. I like going back and looking at like Google Street View of all the places I've lived before and see how much they change. <laughs> Neat. Yeah. Uh, office hours, down, yeah. Invest in real estate. <laughs> yeah. Office hours you doesn't still start can be a millionaire. Forget this computer thing. Computers are for suckers. Yes. You just have to sit through this timeshare presentation now. Um. <laughs> nice. Well, I guess we could get started if you want. Sure. We've got uh, a good. Oh, people are already filing in their questions. Mm-hmm. Very cool. And do you want to play uh, Jessica this week? Yeah, I guess I'll ask some questions. I've been dying to ask this one. It's a good, simple one-liner. Uh, Keith says, my sand guy says he doesn't need separate LUNs for his MDF and LDF. Is that true? So a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, it made a difference to separate your log files from your data files because the log files are sequential. SQL Server writes it from the beginning all the way through till the end. And if you separate sequential access onto its own drives, it can usually go faster. These days, since typically, like your sand guy is referring to hundreds of hard drives that are shared by dozens of servers, there's really no such thing as sequential access anymore. And even inside your own database server, you probably have tens of databases that are all active at the same time. So from a big picture perspective, you don't necessarily really need separate LUNs for MDF and LDF files. There are edge cases where it can make a difference, like if you have automated tiering, where some tiers will move up to faster storage or slower storage. It may end up being better to put your log files on faster storage, but that's more of a a rocket surgery type decision. Generally speaking, your SAN guy is correct. And is this something where you'd want to check your your SAN vendor's SQL Server setup guide too? That's a good idea. Because they might have specific recommendations on that. Good call. Um, all right. We actually don't have very many questions now that I'm looking at some of the giant questions that are here and very, very vague Uh-oh. questions. Um, uh, here's an easy one from Dan uh, at Brent for your always on Dell webinar yesterday. He had to leave early and he said he knows it was recorded. Any idea when it will be online and where? It is right now on the uh, laptop next to me recorded, and I just have to give it to Dell, and then they'll go post it online somewhere. If you registered for it, Dell will send you an email when the webcast is available on their site to go watch. Usually it's something that takes like a week or two. Awesome. Uh, Monica is the lone DVA for a read-heavy, rapidly growing data mart. We currently have no HADR or partitioning and only a primary data file. Assuming a blank slate, does a two-node multi-instance failover cluster with log shipping and partitioning for quarterly data sound like a good direction? Uh, Note, they also run SSRS on the production server uh, that doesn't fail over, and she's asking if that doesn't fail over automatically. 
For the reporting services side, if I remember right, reporting services is not cluster aware. That's correct. Um, correct. Yeah. But you know, the big thing that, that matters is having the service pointed at the database. You can have like a scale out setup where you have multiple reporting services boxes all reporting off of the same catalog database on one server. Um, so uh, in that sense, you have some sort of redundancy if you can find a way to easily like aim connection strings across, but it's not cluster aware. Um, as for the rest of it, two normal instances cluster. It all sounds Clown good in theory. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What do you, what do you want multiple instances for? I would I would oh, push yeah. back on management. Yeah, yeah, like what if especially when you say you have no HA or DR, this means you're piling a bunch of instances onto the same physical server. I would maybe step back and ask the business in the event that we lose this box, you know, how long are we allowed to be down for and how much data are we allowed to lose? Because with no high availability, no disaster recovery, and then piling in multiple instances on the same box, not only is failover hard, performance troubleshooting is going to be tough as well. Yep. Uh, here is a wide question from Marjan. Is it better to have one large trigger or multiple triggers for the same concept? Ooh. Or no <laughs> Why would you have <laughs> Ooh, okay, okay, I get it. Do you it. get to have um, multiple triggers for yeah. the same people, yeah. uh, multiple oh, yeah. insert triggers? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, Richie knows. Right. Have you, have you, so have you guys done this before? Have either of you guys done this before? Yes. Cascading triggers or what? Or like just even multiples, one for auditing and one for business logic and yes. Richie's nodding. So what So what was your experience? Like which one of those two would you prefer, one large one? I, or I, would, I would go multiple. Um, it's a little easier to tune. Um, you could actually do. I guess it, it, it. God, did I just say depends? Ah, it really depends. But, um, but I would go off and and say do multiple first. And if you perform, if you have performance problems, then maybe you could do one. Uh, depending on how heavy these triggers are, do it in one shot. Um, I would say don't use triggers at all if if you can. Um, put everything your logic in your application kind of where it should be. Um, we we use triggers a lot for auditing, right? So like put things like an update date or create date, something that's very light. But if you're doing a lot of heavy work in triggers, you may want to second think about that just just for a moment. From a performance perspective, you asked if one's better than the other, like large versus many. I don't think you're going to find a big difference there unless you find yourself redoing the same work across all the individual triggers. Um, I actually like the multiple small ones too as well because that way I can have one, for example, an auditing trigger that's exactly the same across all the tables where I have to do that. Man, I am by no means saying that's a good idea. It's a crappy idea, but if they put a gun to my head and made me do it, I, I'd break it out into little ones. Uh, I'm in the multiple camp as well just because if you ever decide to, say, replace other parts of the process, but leave the auditing in place. You're still going to have to touch the procedure that involves the auditing, or the trigger rather. And you know, it's just easier to have to encapsulate. Yeah, no, I like that too. If you're if you're doing some kind of bulk load or something, you may want to disable some but not others. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And in the auditing, you could actually get them scripted out uh, fairly easy. And like Erwin or ER Studio, you could, you know, write a script and it will automatically generate all your triggers for you. If for the auditing side, I like that. All right, that's a uh, that was not as scary as I thought it was going to be. <laughs> um, Michael asks, should a SQL Server service account have the rewrite service principal name AD permission to avoid SSPI context login failures? Oh, I have a really good link on this somewhere. I'm going to go search my bookmarks just so I can put it in. I want to say it's um, SSPI. Uh, there we go. Cannot generate. Here we go. It's Robert Davis um, from uh, SQL University Week. So he's uh, Robert Davis wrote a blog post called Advanced Troubleshooting Week Lesson 1, Doing Battle with Nargles. I'm going to guess that's probably a Harry Potter thing that Angie's into. <laughs> uh, yes, yeah, so I'll, I put the you link in. You were already in. grown up and out of college, Brent. It's, it's okay. I'm sorry, you guys. 
Yeah, no, no clue on that one. Um, but he talks about SSPI uh, context errors, so I put that link in there. Um, for those of you who are listening to the podcast, if you just search for SQL Server Nargles, I can't imagine that many blog posts are going to come up. But if you throw in the term SSPI context, that context that should really get rid of all. Of them. <laughs> Greg Smith says Luna loves Nargles. I don't even know what any of these things mean, but. <laughs> It's okay. <laughs> uh, Doctor Who reference. I mean, <laughs> yes, Star Trek. <laughs> what are they? The Wibbles or something? Tribbles. Uh, tribbles. 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 Yeah. Trouble. Trouble. Tribbles. Yes. Um. Uh, all right. Calvin says, "Are there any performance issues with queries crossing database instances on the same server?" So I think Does that mean you're using a link instances. server, a link server, and pointing to a different database on the same server. Is that what that's asking? I think it's stacked <laughs> instances on one yeah. server oh. with linked server connections. So I mean, you just I mean, link servers. Yes, there's performance yeah. issues. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you have a stacked server? When, well, that's interesting. So we should say, what are the performance issues with linked servers? Just so people know why we make these faces. I'll let you answer that question. <laughs> Damn it! <laughs> Curses! Um, so the, the easy one there is that there's the data is not cached in RAM, so if I do a linked server query over somewhere else, I don't cache it locally. I go and get it from the remote server every single time. SQL Server often does a crappy job of predicate pushdown. It doesn't push the like filter predicates over to the other SQL Server every time. So I may say, go get me all the sales for Nargles, uh, or Nargle food, whatever that is, and instead my SQL server just may bring back all of the sales and do the filtering for Nargle food over on my end. Um, there are gotchas around statistics and permissions, um, all kinds of interesting uh, stuff there. Anybody else? Going Jennifer once, going Paul twice. Says, no, that's that's not not <laughs> <laughs> Question answered, got it. Um, all right. The questions just finally started trickling back in. Um, this one's a little vague for me, but maybe you guys can answer it better. David asks if we have a checklist for when we should create a new database versus adding a new schema to an existing database. I've never seen a checklist, but I nope. don't normally use schemas. I have a simple answer on that. If it would, if you could back it up and recover it separately, if I could run a restore command and pull it back by itself without pulling back anything else, like it doesn't need to be at the same point in time as the other data, make it a different database, uh, just makes it way easier to fail over the databases individually, to scale them out individually, um, to do restores and to development for people uh, differently. Um, whereas if the data has to be recovered to the exact same point in time together and you would never restore those pieces individually, then a, a schema could make sense. I would even ask what you're doing with a schema and why not just put them inside the same database. I don't think I've ever, has anybody in here used schemas in, you know, for like separation purposes other than just like naming Chrome? I've did. never implemented them. I've used systems that had schemas. I, I actually did it once uh, myself and it was utterly pointless. Yeah. <laughs> uh, apart from that, the only time I've ever seen schemas in use were AdventureWorks. <laughs> so I feel like uh, Microsoft added it just to be, to be a real world thing. the same um, you know features as Oracle. You know, Oracle. it's used heavily in Oracle, yeah. but I, I just don't think it was ever really adopted on the Microsoft side. Yeah, and I know that in newer uh, microservices architecture where you have each individual service is independent of one another, where either e e each have their own data store. I know that um, there's some people using schemas as that in individual container so they don't have to spin up another database. Everything's in the same database, but they don't really talk to one another. I'm over here reading about Nargles. You guys can just keep going. <laughs> All right. Uh, <laughs> Jennifer asks, uh, she says she's been watching the DMV slash performance webcasts. Um, is there a cheat sheet for if you used to use this one, now you can use this new DMV? Ooh, no. Um, and that's not a bad idea because some stuff has popped up in 2016 that's now replacements. That's actually a really good idea. Um, Blog post be up tomorrow morning by Brent Ozar. 
No, by <laughs> Eric. Eric here for once yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the blogging machine. Yes, yeah. That's why we keep him around mm-hmm. to turn out the blogs. And he makes a really good bouncer. Big guy, you stick him at the front door of events. He, he does, and, and he knows all the good girly drinks as well. So. Does he? <laughs> I didn't <Yeah>. know that. <laughs> I'll tell you the bad. There was just a lot of wine at Napa. I don't remember anything more than that. <laughs> I have pictures. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> pictures or pictures? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> pictures of pictures. Okay. Uh, Mohan is getting CX packet weight only between 5 and 8 a.m. for two procedures with certain parameters, and he's trying to find out how to determine what the CX packet is waiting for. Okay, so this is the classic question, is this really a problem? Mm. Um, The CX packet will appear, and CX packet on a system that that has parallelism will just appear. So is this a problem of the query going slow? Uh, or is it a problem of just CX packet is showing up and I want to know why? I, if it's only with certain parameters, I would get the execution plans and compare them just to see if maybe there's a, a better one. And you know, if you can, if there is a better one and it's not occurring between the 5 to 8 a.m. time frame, you know, see if there's a different index that can be used, a different way of doing the query, or um, you know, is it parameter sniffing, um, maybe even a, um, a plan guide, you know, something like that. But, you know, like Doug said, Doug said, is this really a problem? I mean, if, if it's something where you are passing in one parameter that causes it to have a cost of, like, let's say 3, and then another parameter gives it a cost of 10, and your cost threshold is 5, is there really a problem? Maybe not. You know, so it's, like Tara said, you want to investigate further, but uh, it could just be a normal, natural expected weight. Yeah, I, I had a server that had nothing but CX packet weights, and that was fine for that server. It was it just wanted to do everything that way. It was okay. Okay. Uh, Sergey asks, uh, what is your opinion on VM host level clustering, block level replication across VM farms on different data centers, versus uh, failover cluster instances and or always on availability groups built on VMs. So the gotcha with VM replication is it's copying the whole entire guest exactly as is. So if you fill up the C drive, if you screw up a Windows patch, if you screw up a SQL server patch, um, if there's corruption on the C drive, if there's corruption on the data or log files, all these things take you down for the count. Uh, so we'll, I like to think of VM replication as it's not high availability, it's higher availability. It's better than nothing. Um, and so to find out the right availability method for your RPO and RTO, and even to learn what the terms RPO and RTO mean, go to brentozar.com and click on first aid up at the top. In our download kit, we have an HA and DR planning uh, worksheet, and it's super simple. It's three pages long helps you get to exactly what the right answer is for your SQL Server's needs. I like the the VM host level clustering and then on top of that add on Windows or SQL Server um, HA features. Uh-huh. So you have Log the physical shipping. host um, with the VM level stuff and then you, um, you have the the Windows portion of it too. Yeah, because it's not bad. I mean, it's great. It's It's really cool to have some, you know, the more parachutes you can have in, the better. Uh, Rob has a question about VLFs. Uh, he is running a query to track excessive VLF counts. Uh, good to do, right? Also, what is the magical bad number to shrink and resize the log? I bet if we each wrote down our answer, we would come yeah. up with different numbers. <laughs> we should totally try that. Where's, does anybody have pieces of paper? <laughs> okay. It'll be, it'll be uh, match game. Match game. <laughs> it's like oh, Price no. is Right. Oh yeah, we have to do that. Okay, let me get a piece of paper then. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna bid one dollar. <laughs> Are we actually doing this? <laughs> Apparently so. <laughs> All 
So if you're listening to the podcast, nothing broke. We're all just reading. Your paper. We're just all writing. Oh, I, got <laughs> I keep nothing. forgetting that we're a podcast. So. <laughs> all right. See, edit that out. All right. So on the count of three, reveal. Brett Summers, Richard Dawson, your answers, please. <laughs> <laughs> I say ten thousand, a million and one. No, no way, I mean fifty thousand. I can't 5, see mine. <laughs> I, I think my camera was backwards. Yeah, it is. Oh, uh, it's backwards to oh. you. It's fine here. It's fine here. Oh, is it okay? Yeah, yeah. So the reason why we're all all over the place is there's no real gray area with this, and a lot of us will monitor for lower numbers. So say like we'll look for 500 to 1,000 because we want to catch things before they get hideously nasty. Now, my, my number is usually 10,000. That By the time it hits 10,000, you need to start paying attention because it can really affect startup times, especially if you have several databases that have this uh, kind of number. So it, we, And we catch it in SP Blitz, but I forget what the threshold is in there. If it's like 1,000 inside there, I think we hit. I think it's 1,000, yeah. I haven't seen it recently, so it's probably not, not too common. Um, okay, so I think that's enough about VLFs. Uh, um, since we talked about linked servers, we'll go ahead and ask this question from AD. Uh, what would be an alternative to linked servers other than establishing new connection to the other instance in the application? Why does it have to be other than? <laughs> <laughs> Why, why can't the application what... handle connecting to another instance to get the data that it needs? Yep. Tara, queries are hard. <laughs> queries are hard. I mean, is it, is it because they're not willing to change the application code and this code is in a store procedure and they could just query another you know, instance by modifying the store procedure and adding you know, a link server? I mean, I just don't think that that's a valid answer to, to the problem. And ladies and gentlemen, that is one of the reasons why I hired Tara Kaiser. <laughs> <laughs> she goes, your answer is on it. I agree there. If, the, if you put some, uh, if you had a, a situation where querying from the application was impossible for some reason, um, then, uh, for example, if you have div divisions between the application and that other SQL server and you're trying to get around a security wall, which is a bad idea anyway. Um, so what you could do is you do things like replication or transaction log shipping or whatever to move the database over onto another server. It's not in real time. It's going to have maintenance gotchas or whatever. We'd just always rather say, if you need to query data, go get it. Go get it from where the data lives. Yep. Boom. Uh, <laughs> awkward silence. Sorry, I was reading for and awkward silence. that, that uh, weren't so confusing. Um, <laughs> since we talked about uh, SAN with different drives earlier, this question ties in from David. Uh, they've got some conflicted DBAs. Um, using a SAN, does it matter how many drives you define locally? If all databases are on the D drive, does it make a difference to the SQL server? Uh, one believes it uh, SQL communicates with the by drive slash device, the other doesn't. Bob Door or Bob Ward, one of the Bobs from Microsoft debunked the bejesus out of this. There was a blog post like 15 years ago that said, you should have a different file for every core. And if you put those files on different drives, you'll achieve parallelism. Um, you totally don't need that for parallelism. There was old school advice out there that you did. But if you uh, search for either Bob Door or Bob Ward, parallelism SQL Server files, you'll be able to find the blog post about it. Make sure you read all the way through all the comments because the comments continue to beat that dead horse into submission. And when you read it, read it in that voice. <laughs> oh, let's <laughs> <laughs> It'll take oh, twice as long. Fields. <laughs> You'll enjoy it more. <laughs> ah. All right, Jeffrey wants to know, um, he needs to migrate a couple hundred tables to a new file group, but there doesn't appear to be a third-party tool to do this for him. Uh, do we know if this is a kind of migration that you do manually, or do you try to automate it with something like PowerShell? Wait, what? What's this guy's what? name? Which one? Jeffrey Langdon Jeffrey, at uh, 927. Oh, I'm uh, Jeffrey. Am I missing something, uh, yeah, yeah. Is, or is this not something you would just loop through? Uh, Bob Pusateri has a blog post about this. It's way harder than it looks. Um, 
Uh, the answer is yes. I'm missing something. Yes, yeah, yes. You, you, me too. Well, don't Doug, you have you, to create like a temporary object or move it over? The, you know, in that file group, move the data over and then rename. It has to do with uh, stuff like off-row storage doesn't move by default. Mm. Um, and so I'm going to copy the link to this into his question. Where's that window? How can I lose windows on a 15-inch monitor? How is this even possible? Uh, let's see. They Jeffrey hide. Langdon. Oh, did you? Did you mark his answer is. Did you mark his question? <laughs> yes. Oh, all right. Let me. I'll go track it down. You should be able um, to override it. Yeah, I can find it in here somewhere. Here we go. Um, so it's Bob Pusateri uh, moving a database to new storage with no downtime. Um, so he writes about that, and I put the blog post in there. This poor guy, God bless him. So Bob had to deal with a, a like 20 terabyte database where the former DBA thought every employee should have their own file group and then put uh, all each their own schema as well. So he had thousands of file groups and files that he had to deal with cleaning up after. So... It was so awesome. Ooh. Yeah, God bless him, because I would have left. Yeah, <laughs> that's my, that my reaction as well. Um, licensing question from Ed for always on uh, SQL Server 2012, 2012 core licensing. He understands one free replica. Is that limited to the same data center, or can you have that replica in another data center? That's a great question. You can totally throw it in this in the different data center. You just only get one. Yeah. I like that. Thumbs How about up. the question from Andrew? Log Andrew. shipping. Is that the oh okay, yeah, I saw. Um so Andrew says he's playing with log shipping with their beta databases to a temporary server. Everything seems to go smoothly when the destination databases are set to no recovery, but when he sets the destination database to restore in standby mode, as he would do in production log shipping restores, it seems to fail. For testing, he's got everything set to every five minutes. Uh, maybe that's too often. Any advice? So I, I have a question. I mean, the reason why you would use the standby option is so that users can um, run queries on it. With no recovery, that's not possible. So I suspect what's happening, why the restores are failing, is because users are connected to the instance running queries, but log shipping is supposed to um, disconnect those users to do the restores. And I wonder if maybe um, it's a large query and it's not able to do it in a timely fashion, and so the restore fails. So uh, my question would be, are, are all restores failing or just, you know, sometimes failing. I, I don't think that every five minutes is um, asking, asking a lot for log shipping. It's definitely doable, but you know, what is going on on the, on the um, standby database to be causing the, the failures? How big are the queries that are running? And, and, and are the users, are, are they going to be aware that the, um, their queries are going to be canceled every five minutes for the restore to occur? <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. Is that a problem? Yeah. I don't like using log shipping as, as a reporting instance at all because of it. Or I, so I like it a lot, but only when you can suspend the schedule from like 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Other than that, users just don't tolerate getting kicked out. Andrew says, oh, he answered a follow-up. No users on the temporary servers at this point. Well, it would be interesting to hear more about the error, that why the restores are yeah. failing. Like Check the error log and see what the restore error is. Uh -huh. Oh, God, I have to ask this one. Are you going nope. ask the... Rob Varn, ask Rob's question. Uh, that's what I was just going <laughs> to uh, So Rob says, cash bloat, do you guys recommend to set up a job to clear the cache when it gets above one gigabyte of single-use plans? No. Why is that a problem? <laughs> <laughs> Tara's new catchphrase, why is that a problem? <laughs> the problem that we're trying to solve, is it low memory? I mean, bad plans? What are you trying to solve here? And no, we yeah. do not recommend that. <laughs> Especially, I mean, one gig. Wow. Yeah, it's That's, tiny. Yeah. Very tiny. Even if your SQL Server only has like 16 gigs of RAM, a gig is not, gig out of the plan cache is not catastrophic. If you have a job of any kind to clear the cache, it should be one born out of total desperation and... I've had her. one. <laughs> it was on SQL 2005 with a Java app, and they were using yeah. uh, prepared statements, and it just was constantly getting bad plans, and we just had to keep clearing the cache, and it was just, they couldn't modify the application, and it was a struggle. I was getting called all the time. I remember on Christmas Eve, I was getting called hourly, 
and I had to go to church for Christmas Eve, and I said, do not call me again. I'm not answering the phone, <laughs> and they did it. <laughs> I think I may have actually had a critical care like a year ago that involved, um, I think it was Java. It, it definitely involved some sort of weird third-party app that was just making life miserable, and that was the only solution we could come up with. Yeah, was it was, it was all I had. It was SQL 2005. You know, there, I didn't have a lot of options. Yeah. Desperation. Uh, <laughs> Tim Burnett says, we have big American plan cash. <laughs> <laughs> Super size. I like that one. Um, all right, so here's a question from Curtis. Um, he's a DBA looking for a checklist or blog that speaks to some rationale or justification for getting at least read access to VMware vSphere to view uh, virtualized SQL servers. The current VM admin is rude and locks them out of their uh, locks them out and operates on a principle of if you think there's an issue, open a ticket. Yes, if you search on our site for uh, read-only VMware, so if you go to brentozar.com and search for read-only VMware, or if you use Google, Bing, whatever your favorite search engine is, uh, there is a picture of one of my favorite uh, politicians saying one of his favorite quotes, trust but verify, by Ronald Reagan. Look, I, I was young and idealistic at the time. You know, of course, you always think that the president, as you're growing up, is a good guy. But uh, yes, trust but verify, and so get read-only permissions for that. Show him that blog post. It's designed for VM admins, not for DBAs. And if you won't do it, open a support ticket that complains that the <laughs> VM administrator is a problem. <laughs> or if his vSphere database is in SQL Server, maybe one of those free plan cache jobs might, uh, or DBCC drop clean buffers, or uh, resource governor. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. VM Admin, tear down this wall. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good. That's pretty good. I have right, no Ronald have... Reagan voice. Maybe Doug does. What? I bet you do, Ever. <laughs> I bet you have a decent Ronald Reagan impersonation. Yeah. You have to work on it first. There you go. I'd like to think that I do. <laughs> you know? I haven't done Ronald Reagan in years. I used to do all kinds of impressions like in high school and stuff. I just don't do them uh... anymore. But yeah. Love so your Orson Welles. That's all. Yeah, we should we should finish with uh, Doug's Orson Welles impression of a particular commercial <laughs> on uh, for Paul Masson champagne. <laughs> you can you answer. Can I'm, I think you should oh answer my. this question with that impersonation. Uh, <laughs> Craig question? wants to know if we're due from for a video from Doug around now. Hmm. Oh, no pressure. <laughs> 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 Uh, French champagne has always been celebrated for its excellence. It is a California champagne by Paul Masson, inspired by that same French excellence. It's well, unlike the finest French champagnes, it's vintage dated. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I'm actually working on a, a whole six-hour deal right now, uh, advanced querying and indexing. Um, and there, I, I don't plan on having any drunk Orson Welles in it, but uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, it is a throwback to 70s and 80s game shows. So it's going to be a lot of fun. A lot of uh, large physical props and, and practical sets and, and um, good information. Jar Jar Banks. No Jar Jar Banks. Yeah, so people, if you're bored, go search for Orson Welles uh, commercial outtakes, like drunk Orson Welles on YouTube. It's only like 90 seconds long, and then you'll get uh, Doug's impersonation, and it, it really is good. It's and if you can commercials. find the finished commercial, it is incredible what the production staff did to piece together all that raw footage and get a usable commercial out of it. It's It's phenomenal. Jeez. Well, thanks, everybody, for hanging out with us this week, and we will see you next week on Office Hours. Bye. Thank everybody. you. Hi.